Thank you so much, Lloyd. Really appreciate it. Well, uh, good afternoon for some of you. Good uh, morning to the rest of you. Uh, uh, really uh, uh, appreciate you joining us here, and I look forward to sharing some good information here with you. What we're, what we're going to try to do here is um, honestly share some things for you that are both, whether you're somewhat new to the use of uh, programmatic uh, display and or video, or whether you're a more seasoned veteran. I want to give some pieces for, for each of you here uh, to uh, take with you and, and, and utilize. As I said, my name is Jeremy Hudgens. I'm, uh, I work with a company here called Genius Monkey. We're an ad tech company specializing in the uh, uh, creation of, of cutting edge technologies in order to better utilize programmatic uh, for purposes of driving results. Um, and we have um, really some uh, unique experiences and given how long we've been in this space, our company was founded in 2009 with a heavy focus on, on delivering those results. Um, so today uh, we're going to go through a number of different pieces here, but I think, uh, Lloyd, if we can, go, let's go ahead and bring up that first poll. Uh, one of the things that we're certainly going to be talking about is how do we measure um, our results? And so uh, the, I think the, the question here is, are you currently leveraging attribution uh, in your display and video uh, reporting? Uh, so certainly interested to see um, how our audience here today is, is uh, utilizing attribution if you are. Um, we find that to be uh, something that people are trying to utilize more and more today um, in kind of stepping beyond Google Analytics itself uh, as a measurement for success. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Google Analytics for those of you who are, have not yet started utilizing the more sophisticated measurement tools like attribution, um, uh, but then dive into a little bit of what we have been able to glean from um, the detailed uh, reporting that we're able to generate through um, the attribution reporting system that we've created here. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we kind of went about that and, and what we see in terms of the landscape today uh, in generating all that. So it looks like, let's see. Um, well, we're about evenly split uh, across the board with these answers, so um, this is perfect. We'll try to have a, a little bit of, of something for all of you here, so um, excellent. Uh, I will go ahead and, and, and move on from there. So uh, during this session, we're going to cover a, a number of things, but our primary focuses are going to be on making sure that we give you the ability to better understand your customer's journey and how that knowledge can be applied to your strategy. Um, let's see here. I lost my advancer here, uh, Lloyd. Pardon us here with uh, our, our technical difficulties. All right, and we'll bring it right back for you, Jeremy. Sure, and no problem. Uh, no, I don't. Um, it, may, it may just be down there at the the bottom of of your screen i can go oh okay no that's a, well. yeah it looks like i just can't see it but if i click where it should be then we're okay <laughs> so no worries um so uh, we'll also discuss how to utilize google analytics and other tools to measure the metrics that matters again um google analytics is a fantastic tool and in, in that it is very accessible it's free and so there's certainly some things that we can do if if that is where you're at uh, in terms of trying to measure uh, performance that we can uh, talk about how to look at the data within Google Analytics, as well as some of those other tools that are a little bit more advanced. Uh, let's see here. I may have to have you. Oh, there we go. Did I do that, Lloyd, or did you? I did. Okay. All right. Um, we'll keep moving through here and see what we can do. And again, apologies here, but I'm sure we can make it through just fine. We'll also discuss how to optimize your ad spend and improve your ROI given this data. So this is, these are going to be our focuses here today. You know, uh, one of the questions that, that we're constantly faced with as we talk to different people is, where does display fit in to my advertising? And the answer here, if we can move to the next year, Lloyd, is it, it really is it impacts everything. Um, and it's a very critical piece to utilize uh, if utilized properly. Um, and it really empowers us to be able to engage in a full funnel approach, which allows us to be able to find new audiences, establish that brand awareness with those audiences, and grow our market share. This is a really powerful tool, again, when utilized properly, 
in order to be able to, to grow that market, to find people who have not yet been exposed to your brand but are your prime audience. Um, and so that, that's definitely a powerful, powerful piece. It also empowers us to be able to stay in front of that audience, to be able to increase that customer retention um, and continue to um, uh, build that brand advocacy, if you will. And we can go to the next one there, Lloyd. Um, all together, and go ahead and jump to the next. Thank you. So with that, let's talk about what this, this branding is. I mean, really, because that's what we're saying when, when we're utilizing a display and video, um, it, certainly even within a programmatic sense, we are looking to um, brand our, our audience. And that really comes from the old uh, English and Germanic origins that uh, speaking of burning a, a piece of smoldering wood or to mark permanently with a hot iron. We're talking about really branding that into the minds of, of our audience. And so with that, um, this is difficult today. This is difficult with the short attention spans that we have. If we can jump to the next one uh, here, Lloyd. Um, we can see that our, our attention spans are, are not all that strong. And let's go ahead and pull up that poll real quick. So in the year 2000, the average human attention span was 12 seconds. So go ahead and give us your best guess, if you will, of where you believe uh, the current attention span is. So give us a moment here to, to tally some of these. I think a couple of you have, have cheated and you have seen this data before. So this is interesting in that, uh, well, actually interesting in a couple things. Um, Lloyd, I can actually see uh, the, the arrows now. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if we can what, keep it that way or not. But. Probably, if you hit maximize on your screen, Jeremy, you'll probably okay. be able to see again when we Perfect. go back to the other. Perfect. If not, we'll bring it up for you. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, interestingly, um, the average human attention span uh, today is eight seconds. Um, there. Let's see, it, it, the numbers kind of flipped here as we went through. Um, and uh, oftentimes when I share this statistic, I share this data with audiences live, it's, it's very interesting to actually see that the people who are sitting up front frequently are saying two to three seconds. The further back people go, um, the, uh, the, the more credit they give us. Um, but the, the answer is today the average human attention span is, is, is eight seconds. I always joke that the people who are sitting up front are like me and a little bit ADD. Um, however, um, we shouldn't give ourselves too much credit in that uh, today uh, we also see that the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. So, um, you know, I guess we get more done through uh, multitasking. I don't know. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a serious, serious challenge um, to try to vie for the attention of our audiences. And it's something that really can't be taken lightly either. Uh, when we look at um, the, you know, throughout history, um, various different uh, wars, whether it be the beta VHS or the original tech war, which was uh, Edison and Tesla. And the fact of the matter is, is that Tesla was widely regarded as having the better technology today, uh, now that we know. But Edison won that war based upon marketing and PR, and he went to extreme lengths uh, to the extent that he actually even um, – killed an elephant uh, with uh, Tesla's technology in order to produce some bad PR for Tesla. Um, so, you know, if, if nothing else, we need to acknowledge that just because we have the better technology or the better product does not mean that we can rest on that. Uh, so I will go ahead and try. Yes, you're right. I can advance if I go to full screen. So uh, this is a challenge. Now, one of the things that we see when we're looking at success or, or, or failure, I think really for these reasons, for the, for the reasons that we have short attention spans and, and uh, we, we really need to be sure that we do everything that we can to communicate our message and our value to our audience. Um, but where we see a lot of people fail with their display and video campaigns is not having a healthy enough reach and frequency. Um, we have to make sure that, that we are powering through 
to get that frequency in there, and that's where a lot of people uh, fail, um, especially when we, we, we want it all, whereas it really needs to be uh, more concentrated. Um, in fact, uh, what we see uh, today, if we look at a couple of pieces of data, uh, going back actually to 2013, we saw that the uh, a number of impressions that it took in order for a consumer to feel comfortable doing business with a brand had jumped from uh, 12 to, to 28 in really just a few short years. Now, another study was done a few years later um, that showed one auto purchaser's path to purchase required over 900 plus brand interactions. And so that's a ton. It's a, it, it really is. But what we see is, is if we don't stay consistent and stay in front of people, then uh, we risk uh, flatlining our campaigns. Um, and so that's definitely one area that, that I would suggest that you take away from this discussion and do an evaluation of your current campaigns if you are currently running these type of campaigns to see how many impressions are you getting in front of people. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can attack this in order to shrink down your audience a little bit in, in order to make sure that you do get the impressions that you need. Um, and we can discuss that a little bit later here too as well. So we pulled a little bit of data. We definitely wanted to make sure that we had some good pieces for you here uh, to take from all of this. And so we looked at a couple of different verticals um, to be able to take a look at how many touches is it taking in order for the consumer to feel comfortable. Um, and a good attribution platform or a good reporting platform will be able to feed some of this data back to you in terms of what do you have to do in order to get to that conversion. So in this particular example, uh, in this particular automotive client, we were able to see that uh, 51% of the conversions, almost 52% of the conversions took more than 10 touches, 46 more than 25, and 28% and, uh, of the conversions required more than 50 touches, uh, almost a third of the conversions. Now, if we look at, let's see, a B2B example, we see 55% more than 10, 42% more than 25, 30, almost exactly a third of the conversions required more than 50 touches. And this can be really helpful to, to better understand your audience and what you need to do specifically for them, because all audiences are going to vary a little bit. So it takes uh, more than just frequency, however, it also takes time. So now if we look back at that automotive example, and uh, you know, I think any of you that may have worked in the automotive space would probably agree with me that um, the automotive space isn't particularly patient. It's a very fast-paced business. It's a very month-by-month -month business looking for immediate returns. But when we look at their audience and we actually take a look at what they require in terms of timeline, um, we see a bit of a different story in that 71% of the conversions that took place here required more than 30 days of interaction. And again, this is from the first time that they see one of the ads as they start to express behavior uh, that, that tells us they may be in the market for a vehicle to the time where they actually come through and convert. Um, and we see that 59, almost 60% require more than 60 days, 42% require more than 90 days. So this is significant, uh, really. If we look at a B2B example, uh, we certainly see a longer sales cycle here as well. Um, in that 91% uh, more than 30 days, 84% more than 60 days, 69% uh, more than 90 days. And so what do we take from all of this? Well, we know that certainly it takes more than the region frequency, it does take time, but that timeline is significantly impacted by market saturation, duration to purchase, and so on. Now the best practice is, is consistency. Consistency equals maximize impact. We want to make sure that, that we stay in front. Now there are some campaigns, certainly, you know, if you're promoting an event or it's a political campaign or something like that, maybe consistency isn't so much key. And certainly there's times where you want to flood uh, the market with a little bit more exposure for the brand, say if it's around a holiday season or something to that effect. But regardless, consistency is critical in order to make sure that you stay in front of that audience from the moment that they start expressing that behavior that says that they're in the market uh, for whatever that product or service is until the moment that they actually purchase. 
reason that this is so critical is because if you don't, somebody else will. And I think one of the areas where people get very, very lost from our experience is, is they start to feel like they have more control over their customers than what is feasibly possible. Your customers will engage on their terms, not yours. And it's that patience, it's that honestly selflessness, if you will, of wanting to serve your customer and be there for them when they're ready that produces results. And so this is definitely something where we see that, that, that people are failing. So another area is we talk about different strategies and tactics, I think, is the failure for people oftentimes to utilize the right tool for the job. So let me discuss a little bit about what the, the wrong tool for the job might look like. So geofencing. We were, have been discussing automotive here a little bit. That's an easy one to, uh, to, to use as an example here. But what we see oftentimes is that people are too interested in leveraging the latest and greatest sexy technology, regardless of the fact of, of how their customer wants to interact with them or what that customer behavior and that customer journey looks like. Uh, what we can see here is that, uh, in, in geofencing, honestly, on competitors' dealerships is, is uh, utilized quite a bit in automotive. The problem with it, however, is that the average auto buyer only visits 1.3 dealerships. So the true matter of fact here is that when the uh, auto purchaser goes into a location, the job of the people working at that location is not to screw it up. And anything that we might be doing in order to try to bring that customer out if they're on that physical location um, is really a fool's errand. Um, because if they have gotten there, there's a very good chance they're going to buy there. And the most we would hope to be able to do is to be able to reduce the margins of our competitors. Whereas there's much better tactics that are available. Now, now I want to actually give a caveat here. I'm not saying that geofencing is always bad. Um, if you're trying to get your message in front of people at a convention of some sort, and you know that there's a high concentration of your audience there, or you know other such uh, uh, campaigns, then it can be a very powerful and very very useful tool. Um, it just you have to be very careful about how you apply it. Whereas in this particular case, we would be much better off if we would target audiences based upon their behavior online and perhaps them visiting your competitor's site online. Uh, in fact, there's a lot that can be done there. You know, what pages on the website do they visit? If we're talking automotive, are they, are they looking at trucks? Well, maybe we specialize in trucks. Um, or if we're outside of automotive, if we have a, a competitor that's a, a behemoth of sorts um, that does a lot of different things, but we don't want to target just people who are going to their site. We want to people, target people who are making it to particular pages on that site. We can absolutely do that as well. And so again, it's about how do we use the technology uh, and apply the right tool for the job. So let me kind of walk through another um, uh, strategy uh, piece that, that's very, very critical as well. And I think we'll illustrate a couple of different points on the proper utilization of, of uh, programmatic video and, and display. So we had an, an, an auto group that came to us and they wanted to really, they knew they were a little bit behind. They wanted to jump into um, the, the digital age and they wanted to utilize uh, programmatic display and video um, in an effective way. And they wanted to do something a little bit different, though, and they wanted to have a really, really clean um, uh, test to see how it would work. And they were in a, a somewhat unique position, not completely unique, but a somewhat unique position in that they knew that they were really behind. They knew that they had a bunch of areas where they were wasting money and a couple of other areas that they were spending money that was a little bit bloated. And so they were able to keep their budget the same but still pull apart a, a fairly uh, reasonable budget to be able to test this with. Um, and so at the starting point, they had an average of about 180 leads per month. Now, after implementing all of this, through six months, um, they were able to jump those leads up to 280 leads per month. Again, same budget, so that was a 36% decrease in their CPA within that first six months. But they were very, very smart with all of this, and they stayed consistent. Um, they didn't fluctuate. They kept their budgets the same. They would put a little bit extra from time to time for Memorial Day sales and, you know, things like that. But um, overall, they were, it was really a consistent budget. 
And what they saw was over the course of two years, their monthly leads reached 550 leads per month. That's a huge jump from their original 180. That's a 67% decrease in CPA. Um, did, did splendidly for them and turned them into a, a, a top group. Now, that's all good uh, and, and that's all uh, helpful. However, um, really what's very interesting about all of this is that uh, the areas where they knew that they wanted to stay in and, and continue to advertise and whatnot, but they had cut budget. What they actually saw was there wasn't a decrease in the amount of leads that were coming through those mediums. There was actually an increase. And this is truly the power of utilizing uh, programmatic display and video. Uh, because what it allows you to be able to do, as we said, is to engage your audience early on in the process to get that brand recognition and to drive more of those conversions through. And this is an area, again, where I think a lot of people um, get a little bit confused or get a little bit off track, and that is not recognizing the power of all of these things working together in synergy. This empowers us to not be a one-man band of sorts, but rather conduct a symphony, all the pieces and parts working together to make some beautiful music. And um, I, I assure you, 550 leads uh, for this automotive group was beautiful music, for sure. So uh, this is powerful. Oh, one of the other things, too, and I, I meant to mention uh, a moment ago when we were talking about staying consistent over the timeline and the number of touches that are required, um, one of the reasons that they were able to be so successful with all of this and so efficient was because uh, they were operating with us here on a cost per engagement structure. So I will tell you this, maybe make a note of it if you like, um, and, and set that aside. If you are currently working on a CPM model, definitely make sure you make some changes. Whether you're utilizing a partner like Genius Monkey or whoever you're working with, if you, if you insist on staying with them, um, work on a cost per engagement. We are in the, the, the digital age. There is no reason for us to continue in this space um, when we know whether they're engaging or not. And, and continue to pay for the impression. It also gives a lot of latitude to know that you're actually reaching the appropriate audience if you're only paying if that audience engages. Um, so this is something that we've been doing from day one, and we've seen the marketplace starting to come around to that, so more and more people are operating in that way. But if you're not, you absolutely need to make some changes there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, creative here as well. I think one of the most important things here is that we stay consistent. And by consistent, I mean um, whatever you're doing in your other mediums, whether they be traditional mediums um, or other efforts, you know, via social uh, content or whatever else, um, whatever it may be, that you be consistent with your branding and your offering across all of those. Again, we know, as we just stated, that all of these things working together uh, to form a symphony uh, it, it is critical. So we want to make sure that they are, in fact, working together, that we are being consistent in our messaging and our offering. But that doesn't mean we can't keep it fresh, right? Uh, we still want to make sure that we're bringing in um, various different pieces, uh, uh, variations of the ads and things like that to be able to test those against each other to continue to look for something better. There is always something better um, that is available. We just need to be willing to go out uh, and, and, and to find it. So, and then I actually, you know, I asked as we were talking about this and I was talking with our head of creative, Josh, uh, and I said, is there anything else, Josh, that you want to share with the team? And um, Josh, being the funny guy that he is, said, if your ads don't perform, blame your designer's color and font choices. So, um, if all else fails. <laughs> but, but no, I, I think this is a very critical piece. There are, are, there's always something we can test. So, one of the things that we wanted to do, and we'll go ahead and, and do a poll right now and see if I can actually get back out of this so I can see the answers here. I want you guys to go ahead and, and tell me, if you will, um, what you feel performed better here, whether the ad on the left or the ad on the right. Now, if you're wondering, we did black out the name of the university here. Uh, we do a lot of our work through agencies, They're, so those are not our clients, they're there, so just so we can keep um, uh, that uh, uh, private to them. We wanted to uh, respect that, but um, this was a real ad that ran, and I shall share the results with you here in a minute. It looks like we have a pretty even split here. Give it just another 
few seconds or so. Okay. All right. So uh, we are leaning a little bit stronger to the right. Um, very interesting here. It was very even to begin with, but then we have a, a few more people uh, uh, saying that the, the ad on the right one. So as, as we have a couple more people, and I, I shouldn't have said that because now more and more people are going to choose right, but nonetheless, um, as we have the last few people put in on the poll here, let me just tell you what is really good about both of these ads. Um, and, and I wish I had more time. I think maybe in the future we'll, we'll put some more of these in here. But both of these are really good in that they're both clean. Um, the messaging is, is clear. They're not too busy. Um, we always talk about a, a six-foot rule. Um, just very simply, just as it sounds, stand up, step six feet away from your, your monitor, and see if you can get the point quickly, maybe with even squinting your eyes. Um, and, and that's critical. We want to make sure, can, can, we, can we see what's going on here? What are we talking about? Can we do so quickly? Because obviously, as we're passing by an ad, as we're going through the content, um, or what have you, uh, we need to be able to, to, to communicate our point quickly. So um, another thing that's really good here, and if you're not currently utilizing this, I would strongly encourage you to start immediately, and that is the use of friendly faces. Ads that are more cartoony or um, you know, uh, not as humanized as these are, are going to not perform as well. Now, these things change. Um, this is just what we see currently, and that's the beautiful thing about really the marketing world. It's, kind of, it's almost kind of a living, breathing uh, organism um, that, that you know the taste buds change as we move through. And so, um, but at today, what we do see is these these humanized uh, uh, brands really can work well by again including those those friendly faces. So I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll give you the answer here. Um, both, again, both good ads, but the ad on the right actually did show 22% more conversions. Now, we were able to pull this information out by leveraging uh, some of uh, that advanced uh, attribution uh, technology that I alluded to earlier. We'll go deeper into that later on, um, but this is really, really critical. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can measure this. If it's more just on the front end, just looking at what is our click-through ratio and things of that nature, or more sophisticated in seeing, well, which one of these um, drove um, or contributed more to conversions. Um, but to break down what we think that the difference was here is the ad on the right is a little bit more of a close-up. It's still friendly faces. I think either one of these images would work well. But it was more specific and more clear communicating that this is uh, an RN to BSN degree and it's online. It's easy. So it was very simple, very direct, and, and, and very uh, good at communicating well, what it is that we're offering here. And so that's why, at least we believe we have more conversions. Now, um, this, this poll is a really great example because, again, both of these are good. Um, the consensus was the one on the right one. What I will always say, however, is though, test, test, and test again. It is always a good idea to test. Even if everybody has a consensus that this ad is going to perform better, test it. Now, oftentimes, even with all of our experience in testing these different types of things, we see, um, you know, we're more, more often than not, far more often than not, correct in, in choosing a winner. But we are proven wrong from time to time, and we all can be. And the important thing to remember here is that the only opinion that matters is the opinion of your audience. And so that's why these type of tests are, are so critical. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the measuring uh, of, of success. This is not a new problem. Um, this uh, modern gentleman here, John Wanamaker, who was a department store magnate in, the, in Philly in the 1920s, famously said that half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half, right? And so this was a problem then, and frankly, it's still a problem today. And I don't think that it will ever not be an issue. However, we have come a long way, and the technology is here today, you know, really fairly recently, for us to have far more understanding and knowledge of what is working and, and what's not, um, or at least insights to that. And so one of the ways that we do that, as I mentioned, and, and I know 
Some of you are using attribution, some of you are not, some of you had said not, not exactly sure what it is, and that's okay. So we'll kind of walk through some of that. But attribution is the ability, uh, the, the action of regarding something as being caused by a person or a thing. So how do we give credit, really, if we were to simplify that? How do we give credit to what is helping us to be able to hit our end goal? And so um, there are, uh, and I'm going to speed this up just a little bit here as I uh, see the time, but there are a number of different ways that we can uh, model out for attribution, a number of different methods, whether it be last interaction, uh, last uh, non-direct click, or, or first position, linear decay, um, whatever, uh, or time decay, I should say, or linear, whatever the case may be. There are lots of different ways. But let me kind of talk through the last interaction attribution. Um, this is what most are using, last click attribution. Uh, however, let me give some examples of why this may not be the best thing to utilize. Uh, I use Cam Newton here because uh, he's a good friend of mine, and by good friend of mine, I mean um, we had dinner together um, at one point. And by dinner together, I mean um, I was eating in this nice restaurant in Atlanta, and um, and he walked by, and I said, uh, hey, and, and, and he kept walking. Um, but just, hey, it's a good excuse to tell the story. Um, nonetheless, if we look at last interaction for Cam Newton, uh, we see that he had 488 yards and four touchdowns. Okay. If we look at first interaction for Cam Newton, we see that he had 3,400 yards and 24 touchdowns. Um, this is a bit of a different story. This maybe explains why he's paid $21 million a year, right? We obviously have some value that, that is attributed to him. And I think that's one of the areas where we get a bit lost inside uh, programmatic uh, display and video is that um, rather than understanding the full picture of who's contributing where and how it's all working together, we get fixated on the last interaction type or, or some other method. So let me walk through one of the areas where that is oftentimes uh, the issue. If we look at Google Analytics on, at the most basic format of being able to measure performance, and we see that um, in this particular case, this campaign, uh, we see some good stuff, and we see some things that might cause uh, pause for concern. 63% um, increase in sessions. <clears throat> Excuse me here. A tickle in my throat. 91 uh, percent increase in users, uh-oh, 74 percent, almost 75 percent increase in bounce rate. And so this will really freak a lot of people out. However, if we take a deeper dive and we look at that traffic and break it down, we see that amongst all of that traffic, we have an average uh, session duration of 39 seconds, a bounce rate of 89 percent would explain why that bounce rate went up so much. Um, however, if we actually remove the bounce sessions, okay, and we look at non-bounce traffic, we can see that a ton of people who came through, and, and this is a click-through of an ad, and came to the site that didn't bounce, they spent an average of almost six minutes on the site. Now, again, it's important to make sure that we define what a bounce is. A bounce is anybody who comes to the site uh, clicks on it, but does not click further. It doesn't actually matter whether they've been there for 15 minutes or not, or, or 15 seconds, it's still going to be considered a bounce. So digging into what that behavior looks like at a deeper level is very, very helpful for us to be able not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, which is what oftentimes happens. Now I'm going to, uh, well, if you'll go ahead and give me the uh, screen share here, perfect. And I am going to walk through a quick example of some of the data that, that we're able to collect. All right. And just make sure that you screen share and share your desktop with us. Oh. There we go. I uh, apologize. All right. All right, perfect. So this is a line-by-line -line record of this particular IP address. If you look in the top right-hand corner there, that's an IP address. 
what we're able to do with the attribution technology that we developed, and we didn't desire to do that. Frankly, the attribution technology that we saw in the market was just too limited. It was far too dependent upon modeling. Modeling based upon 5 to 7 percent of the data, um, whereby we tasked our developers with this. They were able to produce something that is able to uh, utilize 95 to 99 percent of the data, which we were far more comfortable with. So what we actually see here is a line-by-line -line record of every interaction, be it an ad being served or activity taking on the website. So. Uh, this IP address was started to serve ads on the 14th of April. As we move through their journey, uh, we see by the 26th, um, over 12 days, they had been served 60 ads. We then see that there was a, a couple of video ads that were served uh, to, to this audience member. Um, every one of, as we scroll down here, every one of these is either an ad being served or as we get to these more complex line items, then we're measuring different engagements that are happening on the site. So in this particular case, we see on the 16th of, of May, they came through and after browsing through the site and, and actually triggering many different types of software conversions, they actually come through and convert uh, on the 16th of May at 5 p.m. So having this type of detailed record of exactly how the users are interacting with your ads and then your site um, empowers us to be able to know far more about them and, and dig deeper into a little bit further than what's available through the likes of Google Analytics. Now we've also been able to take this and feed this back in uh, through our technology to be able to provide some view through attribution inside Google Analytics as well. Um, so that's a, a very powerful piece um, there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, come back, I believe. All right. And Lloyd, will you uh, stop sharing my screen for me there? Perfect. And we'll go back to the, to the slides. So uh, this, is, this is what's available at a, a deeper level. Um, to be able to track the behavior of our audience. And I, I want to get to the question, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up here real quick. So a couple of takeaways from all of that. In this particular case, there was more than 60 ads and three videos. That attribution allows us to be able to have much better understanding of the performance and, and what that data should be telling us. In this particular case, because as I mentioned earlier, we operate on a cost per engagement, there was actually no cost for that conversion. There was no actual clicks on ads, which is not uncommon because the vast majority of people are not clicking on ads at a click-through rate of one-half of 1% 1 being a good click-through rate. But in this case, we're also able to follow that particular user throughout their journey to have a better understanding of the actual impact uh, on our brand and, and, and on our business. And how many impressions does it take? as many as it takes. You know, we saw 60 plus here. We talked about sometimes it's 900. Uh, it's important to make sure that you're doing everything that you can to stay in front of that audience until they come through and convert. Uh, so this is, this is certainly critical to our success. Now, um, that attribution for our purposes is uh, certainly no one wants to go through line by line and, and compile all of that. Um, so we have uh, uh, created a online dashboard that allows our people to be able to go through anytime they like to be able to see uh, how many conversions have been driven, how many impressions clicks, and everything else, but also all of this attribution data rolled up. So we can see how many of each type of conversion. We can see what the contribution is for the various different channels that we're engaging with our audience, um, how they're converting, what percentage of the conversions were touched by each of those channels, be it video, display, search, remarketing, email even, if, if we allow our clients to use our technology for their email campaigns. And we're also able to see what percentage of those are people who have not before been to the site um, that we're driving as new users. Um, generally speaking, greater than half of the conversions we're driving are people who have never before been to the site. But we're also able to see how many of those are supporting and so on. So um, very interesting And once we kind of break all this out. And there's a lot of different ways that we can kind of cut this data as well. 
A wise man once said that everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Um, you know, if you, if you ask that goldfish to climb the tree, I'm just saying maybe the monkey might be a better choice. Again, right tool for the job. So a couple conclusions here, and we'll, we'll jump to the questions. Reach and frequency, avoid the flat line, don't spread yourself too thin. As far as creative, test, test, test again, let the conversions guide you. Use the right tool for the job. Uh, find the holistic view. Make sure that you're not missing the forest through the trees. Uh, take all of that data, put it together in a way that you, you really work to try to understand what's going on uh, with your audience. And conversions are king. Measure the metrics that matter. If that is where we really find that people miss the holistic view most often, if they get stuck on, on one of the pieces on the way to the conversion, rather than helping, letting that help them understand their customer better. So with that, I want to open it up to questions, um, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, thank you so much for that great presentation. Let's see what questions we have already. And as a reminder to the audience, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions live for Jeremy. And it looks like we have our first question. So our first question from um, Ricardo. He says, help me understand Genius Monkey better. Why would someone use you versus your competitors? What makes you different? So that's a, a great question. Um, there's several reasons, but I'll try to keep it uh, somewhat brief here. Um, first and foremost, um, from our ethos, from the, the moment that we were formed, um, which was honestly initially almost kind of by accident, um, but which is a whole other story. Uh, but from our ethos, our focus is on driving results, uh, and hence the reason why we developed uh, the attribution tracking and that type of reporting, because it gives us that intelligence to be able to feed that back and, and use that to drive better ROI. Um, I think one of the other main differences in the way that we operate is the fact that we tap into virtually all the various networks, exchanges, and DSPs, rather than doing what is common in the marketplace of using one, two, or maybe three. By this, we're able to create competition for the marketing dollar and drive down the cost significantly. Um, by comparison, we are about a quarter, maybe a third, at least half the cost of our closest competitors, and that's purely because of the way that we create that competition for the marketing dollar. Um, so it, I think that, as well as, as I kind of mentioned, the, the cost per engagement structure really provides a whole lot of latitude for performance. Very good. Thank you. And that actually answers um, some of the questions that have come in from the audience. So we'll move to our next question. So um, Jeff asks, are touches defined as ads viewed or ads served, or are touches defined across multiple tactics, i.e. ads, email, et cetera? That's a great question, Jeff. So hopefully I understand it correctly. But yes, it, really a touch is defined as um, anytime that we're engaging with them, um, primarily focused on via them seeing one of the ads, um, them visually seeing the ad. So whether that be them watching a video or seeing an ad um, on, uh, say, ESPN.com or what have you, that would be defined as a touch. But we, within our attribution, we're also following them all the way through. As you saw when we kind of went through that animation, you know, we see the deeper line items is the interactions that they're actually taking on the website. Now we're continuing to touch them with ads as they move through, but um, but yes, a, a touch is them seeing one of the ads. All right, very good. We have an interesting question from Deidre. Uh, Deidre asked, do you recommend working with just one digital advertising provider or a combination of digital providers? Mm -hmm. I know radio, newspaper, TV, et cetera, have digital programs, but I'm not sure if working with just one or, or several different tactics is better or worse for consistency. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, it really depends on what you're looking at, but if you're talking about respective to display and video, um, and almost really as a general rule, but certainly specific to display and video, I would recommend working with one provider Certainly in our particular case, because of the way that our algorithms are optimizing towards what is the most cost-effective 
uh, a route to our audience and, and how do we, we maximize the revenue generation and the, the conversions that we generate and so on. Having a system whereby there's free-flowing communication uh, about how, who, when, and where to deliver set ads is critical to performance. Um, it's not to say that we haven't worked with clients that are using other providers as well. Frequently, we're put up as a, a test against other providers, so that, that's something that we do frequently. But um, in the end, it's generally going to be best for you to have somebody have the freedom to optimize towards what's working best. All right, very good. So we actually have a follow-up question. We were talking a little bit about how um, Genius Monkey compares, but this, this question wants a follow-up on that. So um, we mentioned um, that other questions on other costs will be answered by that question, but I don't think mine was. She says, attribution study costs are separate from the cost of display and pre-roll media. How do you structure your attribution study costs, and how do they compare to other companies? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, one of the ways, when we talked a little bit uh, earlier, kind of explained how we're different, you know, when we set out early on, we wanted to make sure that we made it easy for our client and partners. We really view them as partners. And I think that it, we established very quickly, we don't want to have a whole bunch of hidden costs and fees and, 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 and everything else that, that really stack up. And so we wanted a really simple all-in-one solution. So in our particular case, even after we talk about being a, a, a quarter, a third, or oftentimes half the cost of our competitors, that's after all those different server costs, attribution costs, the behavioral data costs, everything is factored in. Um, and that just comes standard. Frankly, doing this without attribution at this level with what we're doing, it would just be a waste. We want to make sure that we're not wasting those dollars that we're optimizing towards what's working. So all that cost is built in. All right, very good. So we have a question from Carrie. How do AdWords fit into this kind of marketing? Would this replace AdWords or work alongside with them? Perfect. These are some great questions. I really appreciate this. It's hard to kind of fit everything in. Um, so this is, this is great. I'm glad that you asked that. Um, one of the ways is we talk about that full funnel approach. AdWords is very bottom funnel. It's the people who are at the bottom are ready to buy or getting really close. Um, so this really empowers that to be able to be operated far more cost effectively because we're getting that branding in. So when they do a search, um, let's say it's not a branded keyword, and what we do see is there's going to be a lot more branded keyword uh, traffic, which obviously is going to be at a much lower cost and help to drive greater efficiency in your, your paid search campaigns. But even if it's not a branded keyword, then you're going to have far better click-through rates, uh, on those campaigns, which will also help to drive down your cost and just far better performance as overall because they're familiar with the brand. So these are definitely things that we would uh, highly recommend that, that work in conjunction. Um, it's one of the reasons why we allow our attribution to be utilized for paid search campaigns uh, because these are obviously very complementary as we look to stay in front of the audience throughout the entire uh, path to purchase. All right, very good. So we have a question from Dallas. Our agency uses a DSP programmatic platform that does use CPM, but not CPE. I have not been able to find a DSP that uses CPE. Do you have any recommendations for platforms? Well, not to shamelessly uh, plug Genius Monkey, but um, we can certainly help you with that, Dallas. Um, as I said, I mean, if, if nothing else, um, that is something that you should be doing at the very, very least. So um, if you'd like to reach out afterwards, happy to put you in contact with a member of our team and they, they can kind of discuss some of these things with you and or we can chat with your agency, whatever's going to be um, the most convenient for you. All right, and it looks like we have time for just one more question. So uh, Mina asks, do you supply these interaction logs directly to your clients? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lloyd, the inter are we speaking of the interaction uh, records as I uh, kind of went through the example that we were asking? Exactly. Yes, they are available um, uh, to our clients. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I don't know that everybody is going to want to go through every single one of them, but we do have those records available to deliver to our clients, yes. All right, very good. So. That looks like all the time we have for in terms of 
questions today. So thank you again for that great presentation, Jeremy, and thank you to our viewers for joining us today. You should now see polling questions on the screen. So before you leave us, please be sure to click once on the radio buttons for each question. This will help us continue to provide you great content. And then feel free to download a PDF copy of today's slide deck. But on behalf of the Digital Summit webinar series powered by Virtual Velocity, we'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes today's webinar.